The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. If we're considering that the kind of Muslim base of Indonesia now has more prosperity, now has more spending power, it seems to me kind of natural that halal haram would become an issue for them in their daily consumption. To me, there's a degree of naturalness that if this base is then developed into a consumptive class, that the same kind of reflections about one's food and everyday habits would would arise naturally. Since the 2000s, especially after foreign direct investment, the flow of capital into the retail sector, into everyday consumerism is really, really large, which means that there's large changes in what it means to be middle class in Indonesia since the 2000s, because there is increasingly insecurity in terms of the kinds of future that we can we can imagine today. In comparison to the 80s and 90s, where Islamic authorities inform on the versus the Muslim middle class believe in, today it needs to be decided on an everyday basis, and that includes retail products. In this episode, the rise and rise of halal consumerism in Indonesia. Here to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. The Indonesian government has mandated that all cosmetic products sold in Indonesia must be halal certified by 2026. And cosmetics is just one category in a long list of goods and services that require halal certification to comply with the 2014 Halal Product Assurance Law. That law only came into effect in 2019 and is being phased in across everything from cosmetics, food and beverages to travel companies, finance and medicines. Increasingly, Indonesian Muslims are looking to align their consumption with their religious beliefs, a push from the faithful that's been gathering pace since the 1990s, driven by a growing middle class and greater access to global products and services – along with an increasing number of private suppliers in sectors like health and education, which used to be the domain of the state. So in a world awash with consumerism, what does halal certification mean for Muslims? How does halal consumerism fit with an increasingly religiously conservative population? Will the new halal regime unite or divide Indonesians? And how do the economic choices play into the political landscape? Joining me are two seasoned Indonesia watchers, Professor Julian Milley from Monash University and Dr. Inaya Rahmani from Universitas Indonesia. Julian, welcome to Ear to Asia and welcome back, Inaya. Hi, Ali. Nice to be here. Great to talk to you today, Ali. Let's start with some context here. How big is halal consumerism in Indonesia, Inaya? Is it a major share of the overall retail market? Um, it's increasingly so, and I just checked the recent at least two to five years of global retail products, including uh, halal products. The total global retail development index in 2017-18 indicates that Indonesia's consumption hits 350 billion U.S. dollars, and among that is 214 billion worth of global hall products consumed in Indonesia. And that's 10% of the total hall products consumed around the world, according to the Global Islamic Economic Report. And you say, Anaya, that it's increasingly a big share. How well established is halal consumerism as a driver of consumer behaviour? Has it always been there? And it's growing rapidly. Is that to do with the growth in the population or is it also growing in popularity? My study uh, draws back until the early 2000s, I think roughly, but focusing on post-reformas in Indonesia, there seems to be an increased drive from market forces to monetize on rising piety of urban Muslims in almost all of the islands in Indonesia. And this coincides, or if not directly related to the expansion of the middle classes from under 45% at the end of the 90s to almost 70% because reports diverge in 2020. So uh, it's, it's increasingly more prominent. 
And Julian, if we're looking at monetizing this rising piety, how widespread is halal certification? Because as we indicated in the introduction, it's not just food. In fact, I'm inclined to ask you, are there any products and services that are not covered by potential certification? Well, the question of halal or haram, which means permissible or prohibited, it, it doesn't apply to to all products. So, for example, very many kinds of food are automatically halal. They don't require any audit or any certification. So, for example, fish is always halal. But, of course, so many fish products that can be consumed are a different thing and they may require some halal certification. So it's very difficult to kind of give a border to it. But Inaya certainly is bringing up a good point in that there are many products and experiences that may not have been considered from the halal haram perspective which are now becoming so. And one of the interesting ones is, of course, the halal banking and finance, because the halal finance and banking industry is relatively new in Indonesia, although the legal basis for it goes back to the 7th century. But the actual industry itself has not really been in existence for more than a couple of decades. And that sort of is a very interesting one, because that gives us an idea of the uptake of halal products. So, for example, in the fields of finance, very many Muslims opt to to not use halal certified banking and finance services. So it's kind of difficult to be able to sort of say where the borders are on the industry. Is that, Julian, partly because it's easier with fast-moving consumer goods and perhaps there's a slightly different approach to those big-ticket items that might require finance, like the obvious one being a house? Yeah, I think so. And I think trust as well. But yeah, absolutely. People can be mindful of in their daily transactions concerning food and so on. But when it comes to those larger things, there are issues of trust involved. That's been a problem, I think, for the halal finance industry. Well, let's have a look at that law, the Halal Product Assurance Law that was passed in 2014. And I guess we're already seeing the impact of it. It started to be phased in from 2019. Julian, what's the significance of that law? And in the years to come, are there going to be, uh, is there going to be room for non-halal products? It is a very significant law. And the background and the history of it is in fact really fascinating, Ali, because there is a bit of a struggle, a major political struggle, in fact, behind this law. So the organisation that's taken the biggest responsibility and probably has the most expertise for making decisions about the halal and haram and certification and audit and so on is the Indonesian Scholars Council, which was established in the mid-70s by the Suharto government during the authoritarian period. Now, at that time, Suharto really kind of established this organisation as a bit of a sort of, you know, to placate the Islamic lobby. At the time, he was busy in monopolising political activity in Indonesia. So Muslim political organisations left political organisations, trade unions and so on. These were really forced out of the political sphere. So he organised this uh, Scholars' Council. It was a kind of gift to Islamic society, but at that time it didn't really have any teeth after the end of the authoritarian period in 1998. The Indonesian Scholars' Council started to started to reflect probably a more narrow idea of Indonesian Islam than previously had been the case and the, the means for them to assert a kind of oppositional platform was really by making fatwa. So apart from having the halal certification, they are another one of their expert bodies is a fatwa making body. And so the organisation started to produce fatwas that were taken seriously by, by a lot of Indonesian Muslims, but at the same time conflicted with Indonesian policy and you could even say with sort of consensus about Indonesian a number of Indonesian political ideals like pluralism and inclusiveness and so on. So this was the same organisation then that started to develop a monopoly in the halal certification and audit industry. The law that was passed in 2014 can be seen as an effort by the Indonesian government to break that monopoly by introducing new players into the audit and certification process. For example, Indonesia has a Ministry of Religion, which dates back to 1945, and there's there's a lot of expertise within that ministry as well. So the effects of this law have been to break or put big cracks in uh, the monopoly over certification audit by the Indonesian Scholars Council. So there is a political background to it. 
At the same time, Anaya, if I can ask you about the certification process, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful role, isn't it? And also a very widespread and all-encompassing role, as we've noted, the vast array of products and the amount of trade that we're talking about. How do you see that now in the in the context of the parties responsible for that accreditation process? Uh, I think what Julian explained is really important in terms of giving context. In the 70s, the position of the Indonesian Scholar Council, or MUE, in comparison to today. Former head of the MUE, Ma'ruf Amin, is currently the vice president. In some moments of political struggles, um, the Islamic credentials of those issuing fatwas of halal haram uh, can be mobilized into the forefront of Islamic political parties because these actors are able to reach out to a floating ummah or a floating middle class undecided in supporting Islamic political parties. But these people, these Muslims, are not necessarily the constituents of political parties. They're not loyalists. But their piety is shaped by everyday decisions of which kind of halal products they need to consume to survive this really volatile world we're all living in. So this is not specifically a phenomenon faced by the Muslim middle class, but also the middle classes all over the world. What kind of education should we get for our children that could secure them a better future, a more economically sound, socially sound future compared to the previous generation? And this spans from food, whether it's healthy for the body, medicine, to big decisions, like you mentioned, Ali, which is where to live. So these everyday decisions can accumulate, can be combined with other decisions by other sections of the middle class. And this kind of informal influence, when political moments permit, can have really political economic consequences to the overall direction of the country. I'll come back to that political side of this discussion a little later, but is that how you see the popularity of halal products? Is it about a response to to daily life, to the broader consumerist picture, to the stresses and strains in daily life? From the 2000s, I would say yes. Before that, uh, before that meaning that the kind of uh, uh, Tarbiya or Muslim Brotherhood movements uh, in opposition to then authoritarian President Suharto much throughout the 80s and 90s that informed the kind of activism, anti-authoritarian activism, pro-democratic activism was really ideological, meaning that the students, uh, part of the movement, really discuss the verses of the Quran and the Hadith to inform the decision and their political position against or for the Muslim scholars that are close or um, criticizing the president. But since the 2000s, especially after foreign direct investment, the flow of capital into the retail sector, into everyday consumerism is really, really large. And it went into the smallest parts of the middle class reality, which means that there's large changes in what it means to be middle class in Indonesia since the 2000s. So yes, because there is increasingly insecurity in terms of the kinds of future that we can we can imagine today since the 2000s, Islamic belief, Islamic verses that are more of a hodgepodge, more of an everyday decision in comparison to the 80s and 90s where Islamic authorities inform on the verses the Muslim middle class believe in. Today, it needs to be decided on an everyday basis, and that includes retail products. Julian, is that how you see the popularity of halal products? Is it a, a question of, I suppose, as you've written, consumption as a legitimate element of pious self shaping? Look, this is one of the really interesting questions that you brought up here, Ali, because there's a lot of continuity with, I guess, the kind of periodization that we're referring to here is the growth of the middle class in Indonesia, which, as Inaya pointed out, is is a recent thing. But I'm not sure to what degree halal sort of practices have changed that much. If, If we're considering that the kind of Muslim base of Indonesia now has more prosperity, now has more spending power, it seems to me kind of natural that halal haram would become an issue for them in their daily consumption. So how much of a change that is, I don't really know. Or to put it another way, I think that the halal status of one's everyday undertakings 
probably has always been part of Indonesian life. So, for example, and that can seem strange to people outside that environment. So I know a couple of times when I've been doing research in Indonesia in more village environments, and people would be talking to me about where I came from, and animals would come up, like the kangaroo, for example, which is our national emblem. And a couple of times I was asked whether the kangaroo was halal, was halal meaning could it be eaten? And of course, that comes off as a really kind of quaint question. For me, I thought it was a very strange, but then after a while, I realized, well, this is an environment where people are constantly reflecting on these kind of things. And that was a village environment. So to me, there's a degree of naturalness that if this base is then developed into a consumptive class, that the same kind of reflections about one's food and everyday habits would would arise naturally. Do you see my point there, Ali? So that I think is an interesting question about how much of a change or is it just an expansion of one of the basic issues of being Muslim into a new consumptive environment? And is there a question also, though, of chicken and egg, though, because it's a question of what is available, what is certified, where emphasis is given. So with food, for example, that may be very traditional, but when it comes to things like clothing and cosmetics, what's driving it? Is it because the government is providing a certification and mandating a certification process, or is the government responding to demand for that sort of certification? Look, and you have to add to that as well the question of the national media. And in fact, Inaya has written a fascinating book in which she she took a, a very close look at the explosion in Islamic television that happened, I guess, in the early 2000s. So this is just after the authoritarian period. And during the Suharto time, except towards the end, perhaps, but basically for that 30-year period, there wasn't a media industry that was liberalised. It was really heavily regulated and there was no capital in the media industry either. But this changed rather suddenly after the end of the authoritarian period. So suddenly... Islamic television became a much bigger thing because, of course, with Indonesia being around 90% Muslim, of course, people are interested to watch to watch Muslim television. And Inaya found something very interesting, and I'm, I'm generalising a bit, but what she found was that in the narratives of the dramas people were watching, she found that you could always see in them a kind of suspicion about consumption in its Western forms. And we're talking sort of soapy sort of dramas here. But basically, a driving thematic of those narratives was, look, let's be careful about the effects of Western consumption because we want to be involved in that and that's prosperity and that's good. But at the same time, there is some kind of trap here. And quite often the narratives resolved in a kind of a sort of morally validated Islamic position. Do you see what I mean? So what you have then is you do have an idea that you get an image of a country where suddenly mass media was problematising something that the mass media was also creating. And probably the outcome is a rather more pious, maybe, and conservative and disciplinary one than had been seen in Indonesian television drama before that. So, yeah, the chicken and egg question is a really good one, Ali. It's a very complicated mix. And I, obviously, that is your research that uh, Julian was just referring to. Do you agree with his summation? I do, yes. And I understand what Julian is trying to say, because when we talk about uh, how piety is shaped and reshaped, we need to think about what kind of middle class we're discussing. When we're talking about the urban middle class, they are informed with the difficult moral decisions of facing increasing influence from Western products and global products. Hence, the halal certification responds to the abundance of choices that the middle class is facing. But when we go to rural areas, there is a very different type of middle class. And I'd like to really emphasize the fact that within the state narrative until today, when Maruf Amin, uh, Eric Tohir, the state minister for enterprises, are discussing about the value of our economy, village Muslims, village middle class Muslims and working class Muslims living in the rural areas outside of Java, outside of large cities are largely absent because they don't have the buying power. So I think this also needs to be uh, discussed. So essentially, you're saying that lower socioeconomic groups are simply not part of this consumer push? Exactly, yes. And how significant do you think that is, particularly if you look at this from a social justice point of view? The kinds of halal, haram, or the fatwas issued by the MUE, the Indian Scholars Council, responds to demands of the middle class. And usually fatwas becomes really political uh, during moments of electoral politics. However, within this concern, there's little discussion about social justice, about redistribution effects of Islamic economies, 
when despite that many movements on the grassroots levels like from ACT or Dompet Duafa or Baitul Mal in rural areas and the outskirts of Indonesia are working on this. Of course, it's not ideal, but I think when we're talking about Islamic economy, when we're talking about halal consumerism, absent in much of the uh, literature and the uh, formal state discussion, legalistic discussions, is the what kind of redistributive economic effects are halal consumerism and the halal economy in Indonesia and maybe also uh, in the Middle East or Muslim-dominated countries have on working classes and people living in the rural areas. So do you see it? as dividing the population, or if not dividing, then creating a sort of them and an us and a have and have nots in the context of have the ability to make a choice and have not because they're simply trying to survive day to day? To be very frank, Ali, I sympathise more with the 50% of Indonesian population struggling to make do with the kinds of casual work and the everyday decisions that they have to make. Uh, in line of the moral decisions, whether uh, Islamic or otherwise. But however, the middle class is the largest driving force that informs on the political parties and political elites and certification boards on the kinds of products that need to be certified. And between the middle classes, as Julian has already mentioned, there is a tension between Islamic conservatives, meaning conserving values, conserving the traditional family structure in which there is a husband and a wife and two or three kids or more that needs to be the pious Islamic family or warga sakina. So this is uh, the smallest social unit that goes against or oftentimes in tension with the kinds of pluralist Islam, gender equality discourses that are supported by, I try to avoid using the term liberal because it's too liberally used and never really defined, but the Muslim middle classes who are more cosmopolitan or more responsive to the idea of being part of a global world in which Western values are part of. And these two camps are usually monetized, exploited to the benefits of certain political elites or for the market, uh, for the market interests. So they're segmented in different ways and they consume specifically different products and endorse different products with specifically different kinds of Islamic narratives on social media. So Julian mentioned television at the 90s and early 2000s, and now it has fragmented into social media platforms in which different sections of the middle class vouch and advocate for, on the one hand, conservative Islamic values, and the other hand, cosmopolitan pluralist Islamic values, when in fact they're part of the same middle class, both forgetting about the struggles of the working classes and poor Muslims living outside of their urban milieu. I want to come back to that whole uh, impact, I guess, and influence of things like social media as well as mass media, which we've touched on. But Inaya, can I just ask you about this reinforcement of conservative values? And Julian talked about more conservative choices, but Inaya, you've written how the mundane and ordinary can contribute to the rise of religious conservatism. Why does halal consumerism equal religious conservatism? There's a thesis by a really influential scholar in the U.S., Bali Nasser, that said if there is an influx of market capital to Muslim-dominated countries or Muslim-majority countries, there will be a moderating effect and it will strengthen democracy. So this is behind the idea of Western, Western quote-unquote, uh, U.S. capital interest in Muslim-majority countries and when retail products or assets are certified as halal, it's to also have a moderating effect on the Muslim middle classes. But in fact, when we see at least uh, the past 10 years of elections, conservative Islamic values are at the forefront of supporting certain Islamist uh, political parties backing up political actors. And the most prominent, I think, arguably would be the 2016 toppling over of Christian Chinese governor Basuki Chahya Purnama in favor of Anis Baswedan, who is currently running for president after he finished his term as the governor of capital city Jakarta, in which the formerly on the fringes Islamic Defenders Front during the authoritarian period was actually in the mainstream of uh, the support for Anis in 2016. So the more abundant halal consumption decisions and the more choices the Muslim middle class has, 
there is a conservatizing effect on the floating middle class UMA, as we see uh, in the 2016 local elections of capital city Jakarta. You've written a lot about those mass rallies against the former Jakarta governor, Ahok, in 2016 and and what they represented. I, I just wonder, Julian, can I ask you, do you agree that there is that link between religious conservatism, growing conservatism, with halal consumerism? Does one feed to the other? Look, it's a difficult question, in my opinion, because I don't see the kind of direct link in that as to why proliferation of consumptive choices ought to make one more conservative. I guess if we drill down into more sort of detailed case studies, I can see one sort of specific area of society where this might be the case, and that is that these kind of things tend to have a bigger influence upon women than they do upon men. And that's because in all societies, but especially in an Islamic society like Indonesian, the kind of public pressure upon women to be the bearer of the you know, community morality is very high. And I think we've seen that in relation to the question of women's sartorial choices, head covering and the choice of clothing, clothing that reveals the shape of the body, clothing that conceals the shape of the body. Now, this is a good example because clearly women probably have, in some ways, have more choices than ever before as to how they dress in Indonesia. However, at the same time, a kind of growing public morality has probably narrowed the choices. And so, for example, if we compare the amount of women who choose to wear head covering now in comparison with 40 years ago, the difference is remarkable. It's much more common now. As for whether that's caused by consumption, I'm I'm not really sure. I think it's a more complicated product of a sort of global Islamic revival that's been happening for quite a few decades. And secondly, women's increased participation in the mediated public sphere, in the television and online social media that we've been talking about before. As well as that, of course, in Indonesia, the state ideology of Indonesia has really kind of created this idea of women as being the heads of the domestic realm, while the public realm is one that's dominated by men. That's been a kind of really strong ideological component of Indonesian society for a very long time. But, you know, on the other hand, women are exercising choices as well with the sort of pious deportment. So, for example, social media provides women with opportunities for making public claims about their party that previously they couldn't do. So in that sense, I'd love to hear Inaya's comment about that. Does she think at all that public social media platforms have provided an opportunity for women to be to go public with pious models in ways that they hadn't been able to before? I think so, Julian. I really appreciate the kind of acknowledgement you're making on the complexities and the awareness you have in being careful with pulling a causal link between both. So it's safe to say that there is a rising market interest for halal products and there is a rising highest practices across Muslim middle classes in Indonesia, whether or not it's uh, dialectical or it's interacting with each other is up for discussion. In terms of the role of women, interestingly, there are um, spaces for both male and female Islamic leaders through social media like Felix Yao and Hanan Ataki, and also female fashionistas, hijabers that have a large following who are ordinary people, but with Tarbiya or Muslim Brotherhood roots like Halima Alaidrus and uh, Sherry Anafita. And these are well-educated female influencers. They're exposed to Western education. And at the same time, they're advocating for conservative values, meaning that the women's place is in the domestic realm and whatever education you gain outside your domestic space needs to return to raising children. And that's predominantly the female role within the pious Muslim family, Kwarga Sakina. So on the one hand, uh, female Muslims, middle class Muslims who are able to gain a large following in public domains, meaning via social media and outside the Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama, the two largest Muslim organizations in Indonesia. So they're outside the institutions. They're, they come from informal spaces and use social media as a tool for propagation are also reinforcing the kind of conservative patriarchic ideals that are reminiscent of the 70s and 80s. There's always a contradiction 
with more mobility, with more autonomy, uh, there also comes possibilities for reinforcing the kinds of conservative values that is problematic. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Indonesian watchers Dr. Inaya Rahmani and Professor Julian Milley. We're discussing consumerism among Muslims in Indonesia. And I just uh, staying on the role of women, I guess, and you mentioned them before, but can you tell us a little bit more about who the hijabers are and what their motivations are? So there are many types of hijab communities online, but the most prominent are middle class affluent women, Muslim women who were at the forefront of the Jakarta Islamic Fashion Week. So they're cosmopolitan. They align with the kinds of modest fashion movement around the world and advertise modest fashion and Muslim fashion across their following. And they signify a kind of upward mobility that many Muslim women aspire to in terms of deciding on what kind of hijab they want to wear, how much it costs, and what it symbolizes in their direct communities. And the function of the hijab is not only for spiritual purposes to become a better Muslim, so to speak, based on the interviews that we did in 2016, but also um, a tool for social movement, not only to protect themselves against sexual harassment, but also for them to have some upward mobility because the hijab also symbolizes middle class identity. And some types of hijab indicates affluence, indicates stability, economic stability and security. So they have wide influence over their following. They produce their own fashion products and advertise it in small communities, but no less linked with global fashion. So is it fair to say that while there's uh, obviously a, a number of motivations, there would also be in there a profit motivation? Yes, definitely there is a profit motivation. Julian, if I can put this to you first, that's one of the very big issues here that producers of halal products do have a profit motive. Do those who buy into halal consumerism believe they're buying a better product and how do they balance the profit with the pious? Well, I guess one way of looking at it is that the clothing, the pious clothing and the pious self-representation can be seen as a pious offset against other options that are not so pious. So for, to put it this way, the shopping mall, for example, which is a kind of newish thing in Indonesia, I guess it goes back quite a number of decades now, but the shopping mall, of course, is a really popular place for young people to hang out, okay? that's That goes everywhere and especially so in Indonesia. At the same time, that kind of sociability can also be a cause of concern for a lot of Muslims because it's the question of sociability between young males and females without the proper conditions attached to it. But what you do find is that people develop ways of going to the mall that protects them from that kind of the sort of more improper aspects of it. So the way people dress helps them to do that. The way people have contact with members of the opposite sex also, it's really regulated in a way so that it's nothing like the kind of sort of free sociability that we might expect to find at shopping malls here. But nevertheless, it still is that kind of shopping mall sociability. So you you have this idea that, okay, well, that looks like this is really profit-oriented sort of marketing of clothing options. But at the same time, these can be considered to be a sort of protection against other options that that are far worse. And as for the profit thing, well, I mean, I think that in Indonesia now, there isn't really a lot of resistance to the kind of marketization, commodification of Islamic products. But nevertheless, of course, there are people who do sense that there should be some kind of border between consumptive behaviour and pious behaviour. One's linked to you know, submitting the self to revelation and to cosmology and so forth, whereas the other is about gratification and display and a profit accumulation, all those things that you might think are anti-religious. But really, the blending of them is so strong and contemporary Indonesia at this point in time that 
the resistance to them that is explicit is kind of hard to find. And I do agree with that, that in, in some ways it's about, I suppose in summary, it's about the least worst option. Yeah, unfortunately, I do agree. And I think the important point Julian made is if we look at it in a macro systemic way, it might seem like it's just profit oriented interest overcoming every Muslim in Indonesia, every Muslim middle class in Indonesia. But on the other hand, if we look at it from a micro everyday setting, if capital Western influence is inevitable, the small decisions to put on the hijab, to know which mosque to go to in a shopping mall in Jakarta, staunch with inequalities becomes, while a small space, but still a space to perform alternative spiritual values in the face of Western capitalism. So it depends on which way we want to see it. But I think it is the reality and it's the least worse option from the subjective views of Indonesian Muslims. And Julian, you made the point just before that there's not much resistance to this, but is there any pushback? Is there any opposition to halal consumerism? Yes, there is. For example, if we look to a part of Indonesia's Islamic intellectual life called the modernist or reformist part, which goes back to, it's a really 20th century phenomenon in Indonesia. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there emerged in Indonesia a Muslim movement, intellectual movement at first, urban that had in its focus the relative backwardness of Islamic societies around the world at that time. So there was a time when Islamic societies everywhere were under the colonial domination of smaller European nations, numerically smaller European nations, and the Islamic modernist movement was the response to that situation. And typically in their thinking, they weren't focused strongly at all upon the kind of particularities and the sort of fussy details of what you wore or or how you prayed or what kind of legal school you you fall within. They really took up ideas of social and political organisation that they had observed in Western countries. So their main focus became political and economic progress of Muslim societies. That was a very important part of Indonesia's movement towards independence in 1945, the contribution of that movement. In the post-independence period, the modernists have continued to focus upon social and social development, and they've created a kind of welfare state type mentality. So the, the modernist groups that you find in Indonesia now, the biggest one has universities, hospitals, orphanages, and it's really dedicated to all those kind of capacity building, social, economic Projects. Now, amongst the intellectuals from that crew, there's a lot of disappointment about the consumptive turn because they thought that Muslims were going to free themselves from worrying about that kind of thing. Muslims were going to free themselves from worrying about how you prayed and how your neighbour prayed and, and the clothes you wore, and that they were going to participate in the creation of a prosperous nation, and I mean that in the political sense, that was going to be a prosperous place for Muslims and for non-Muslims as well. So it's a big disappointment for them to find people suddenly focusing really, really closely upon what kind of hijab they wear or what kind of package they take on a pilgrimage or the more fussy side of it. For them, that's the sign of a retrograde step back to a kind of Islamic subjectivity that that is not really going to contribute to political and economic progress. This is this notion of non-productive ties of obligation and duty. Yeah. I mean, it very much replicates, of course, the old, the sort of reformation and its discontent that it had towards the hierarchies and the sort of legalisms of of the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. It kind of reflects that in, in some ways. It's a retrograde step from that perspective. And I, you've talked about how there's, you know, entire groups of the population that's just simply not part of the conversation. Do you think that that pushback will be something that we may see more of or the, the overwhelming momentum is with the growing middle classes and in favour of these sorts of consumer choices? However strongly, I hope that the working classes and lower class Muslims have more voice and more space to express their politics. Unfortunately, I think we will see a stronger drive from the middle classes in informing the direction of the halal economy and halal consumerism in Indonesia.
So I guess if we return to the political side of this conversation and what that will mean for politics going forward, because it's interesting that while, as we've talked about in I, there is a religious side to it and, and this sort of conservatism can be mobilised if the message is right, at the same time, religious political parties have not been standalone successes, have they, in Indonesia? No, they have not. They don't have a loyal social basis to support their agenda. And why Why is that? That almost seems counterintuitive, given we've been talking about this increasing religious conservatism. Uh, I would like to continue on what Julian explained, because I also sympathize with the Muhammadiyah, the institutions, the kinds of institutions of social and health and basic services that Muhammadiyah provides throughout the country. But now, today, in the current incumbent government, and U Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, which is rural-based, traditionalist, and has very clear hierarchies between Islamic authority and the followers, are very close to power at the moment. So there's a different dynamic compared to the previous regime. Uh, and Muhammadiyah is traditionally quiet, more quiet in political uh, tension and political discourses. Uh, they tend to practice a piety through actually public services and don't discriminate against Muslims and non-Muslims. But because uh, they stay outside of uh, elite politics for good and for bad effects, good meaning that they can stay the course and even have networks of schools to the outermost regions and islands of Indonesia. And on the other hand, they have little influence over elite political discourses in central government. So it's a, a pro and con decision on the side of Muhammadiyah and so many other diverse Muslim movements, Islamic movements in Indonesia that are not informed by the floating middle class Muslim politics that are monetized and exploited by the current elite. Julian, do you think that even though, as Anaya has just been talking about, religious political parties haven't been successful, could you achieve political success today in Indonesia without strong Islamic credentials? Well, Inaya referred earlier to the 2017 Ahok case where a political candidate who sort of, in inverted commas, suffered from a sort of double disqualification of being of minority Chinese ancestry and second, being a Christian. And there was this remarkable mobilization of diverse Islamic segments that put an end to his campaign to become the governor of Jakarta. That was, I think, a salient moment. And the other remarkable incident that we've seen recently was that the current president, President Jokowi, he did invite an Islamic leader, this is Ma'ruf Amin, who previously had a very conservative track record and who had a very strong following amongst the conservative sort of Islamic segments that had rallied around Jokowi's electoral opponent, Prabowo Subianto, he recruited him to become his uh, his running mate. And now he's the vice president of the Republic of Indonesia. And this was an incredible moment because this was such a heavily symbolic move. I mean, Ma'ruf Amin was a very respected and influential religious leader, but his qualifications really for taking on the role of vice president were, were very low. But by making that move, it really was an effective one because it suddenly made, I mean, Jokowi could present himself as being the protector of Islamic interests because the vice president was a person who was so influential amongst the conservative segment. Well, at this point in time, I think, it's difficult to see that that situation is going to be unwound. And of course, the ironic thing is that Muslim political parties, that is Islamic political parties with a specifically Islamic platform, have not really had a lot of electoral success with Indonesian voters. And there could be, I think, a number of reasons for that. But the two most important reasons, I think, are one, that just because someone's a Muslim doesn't mean they're going to vote for a Muslim party. And there are political parties that are very attractive for Muslims, which don't have Islamic bases. For example, in Java, the party that President Jokowi currently represents, which is the party of the Sukarno political dynasty, does not have a specific Islamic platform, but it is voted for by a majority of voters in Java. It's a very popular political party in Java. So you find that you know Muslim voters will support non-Muslim parties. The second point, of course, is the fragmentation that the Muslim parties reflect. So it's not the case that Muslim political parties try to appeal to everybody. In fact, they generally appeal to fairly limited Islamic segments. And that means that the Muslim vote is fragmented. 
okay, which reflects the actual fragmentation of Islamic society. But at the same time, it reduces the, the combined efficacy of Muslim politics because you have all these votes being distributed across so many parties with not much trust between them. And Anaya, as we head into the next general election in 2024, would you agree there's no going back from that trend? I agree with Julian. Uh, Islamic credentials is very important to maintain electability. At the same time, the Islamist political parties don't have a strong social basis and they're fragmented in their agenda and they don't have the money to build a convincing campaign to mobilize people on the ground up because Indonesian Muslims are, in fact, very, very diverse. That diversity, I guess, is the, um, well, it's a challenge, isn't it, for anyone who wants to win power in Indonesia? Yeah, I think so. But very good for a market. <laughs> yeah, it is good for the market too. And in line with that, about the last two decades, have seen the emergence of a newly mediated class of Islamic authorities, and that is the preachers. I mean, preaching has always been a massive thing in Indonesian Muslim society. But with the kind of deregulation of the media and the creation of so many platforms and YouTube and so on, preachers have become, (laughs) they've had profiles now that they didn't have in the past. And this is a kind of, if you like, a bit of a wild card sort of space of Indonesian Islamic society because the individual voice, preaching voice, who achieves a kind of figure of celebrity because of their oral skill, their virtuoso delivery, and is able to attract a large following, they kind of are very independent and they they sort of craft their own programs. And during times of elections, the biggest celebrity preachers, well, politicians will go to them and say, well, could you support me in the forthcoming election? Even though the person doesn't have any kind of social base of any sort of defined nature, But these people are really creations of media possibilities, starting with television and then cassettes, of course. Audio cassettes were a big part of this, then DVD and CD. And now, of course, the online thing has just uh, opened it up massively. And that's another interesting aspect of Indonesian Islamic diversity because it adds a new layer of authority and takes away from the existing sort of geographies of authority. And those kind of things always create uncertainty. I think you've just started a whole new podcast for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> there, there is so much to talk about. Inaya, can I give you the last word? Do you want to just respond to what Julian said? I agree that it should be a new podcast <laughs> in terms of possibilities. <laughs> Uh, on the on the other hand, as well, there are strong conservative values from those influencers. So these new spaces reproduce the things we are seeing in the political arena. Well, I think we should definitely have another conversation as we head into those general elections in 2024, because as I said, there is much to talk about. Professor Julian Milley and Dr. Inaya Rakmani, thank you so much for talking to Ear to Asia. Ali, thank you so much for having me on the program. Thanks, Ali, and thank you too, Julian. Our guests have been Professor Julian Milley from Monash University and Dr. Inaya Rahmani from Universitas Indonesia. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 24th of October, 2022. Producers by Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2022, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.